Hey everyone, this is Ryan from Badgerland Birding along with Derek and we're here with a special guest today, Matthew Thompson, a birder that we know from Minnesota, who's here to talk about some of the exciting things that are going on in Minnesota this year, especially with winter coming up in Saxon Bog being a hot destination, the Ross's gull that was seen in Minnesota this past week. Um, so Matthew, thanks so much for joining us. We're really happy to have you. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Um, like I, like they said, I'm from Minnesota, so I get kind of a different set of birds, but a lot of like similarities still. So it's kind of fun to compare and contrast the birds there with the birds here. I feel like um, you've been killing it up there lately. Like, yeah, I feel, I feel like anything that I see rare reported immediately after like Matthew yeah. Thompson shared a photo and it's always whatever that rare thing yeah. was that was just reported. I, I'm pretty quick to act with a lot of the rare birds. Um, my state list, I think, is somewhere around 350. So that's pretty high, um, especially for my age, because I'm 17. So do you think uh, that helps or hurts? Uh, I think it helps. <laughs> I don't know that I'll stay here my whole life, but I, I do like it here quite a bit. So yeah, for sure. So what are some of the things that have showed up this year in Minnesota that you guys have gone after? I feel like this could be wrong and it could just be my own bias, but I feel like you guys get a little bit more of the interesting species than we do. Like you guys got more of the like rosette spoonbills. You got more of the Lincolns. Mm -hmm. It seems like Minnesota yeah. is kind of a hot spot. Oh, a lot of people actually, at least last fall and winter, they were commenting a lot on you guys getting a lot more birds because you guys had the brands and all the, I think you guys had multiple red fall ropes. We didn't have any last year and that was pretty cool. And then the brand, I know you guys had a video on. That was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Why don't you explain how you got into birding, you know, with you being so much younger? Have you always been doing this or was it a more um, recent thing? I have kind of always been into birds. I definitely like nature since I was a kid. A lot of kids kind of like nature when they're really young and then it just never really went away for me. I mean, it kind of did when I was like 10-ish. I kind of got more into video games, but then I transferred back into nature. So, um, yeah, I, I've always gone on lots of hikes with my family. Um, my parents are very like outdoorsy. They love to take hikes. They're not like birders per se, but they're, they really enjoy the outdoors. Um, and they got me uh, some bird books when I was young and we always had a feeder set up. So I just kind of took a lot of interest in that. And when I was really young, I actually liked dinosaurs a lot too. So <laughs> we're big dinosaur fans too. Um, what do you think led that transition when you said you got more into video games and then you kind of were brought back to birding? What do you think yeah. led you to that? Um, mostly just like friends at school kind of talking about how fun the video games they, they were playing were like Minecraft. I don't, you probably heard of Minecraft, I'd assume. I got I've really heard into, of it. Yeah. Yeah. Minecraft and Pokemon. I got really into Pokemon, um, when I was like fifth grade, fourth grade ish. And then the next year, or maybe like six months later, we took a trip to Disney world mm -hmm. and I got to see all these cool, like Florida swamp birds, like mm -hmm. Anhingas and tricolor heron and all, all that good stuff didn't get any spoonbills on that trip just because they're not really as common in that area but mm -hmm. uh it was still really cool and then i feel like that kind of sparked it too and then when i was 12 i saw a belted kingfisher in the pond across from my house and i had never seen one i've only ever seen them in books so it was like mm -hmm. really cool that was the one that did it you're like yeah. now that i have that belted kingfisher that yeah Process. i feel like that was definitely kind of a spark bird somewhat but i definitely did like birds before that mm -hmm. I, I would uh, say the pokemon connection i think is actually pretty strong with birding because mm -hmm. to me like the idea of pokemon and like going out and finding rare pokemon and whatever is so similar that i think people that played the pokemon games and watched the tv shows when they were younger can really relate and it feels like a very easy slide into birding mm-hmm it's just like more like real world stuff. It's kind of cool. I really like birds. You're more. like, I'm an adult now. Instead of finding Pokemon, yeah. I find birds. Yeah, birds are for adults, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, that's actually an interesting question, though, is how do you feel it is to be a younger birder in a hobby that's kind of dominated by people that are usually like retired or viewed as being an older generation? Um, it definitely feels a little bit weird when I show up at stakeouts because, um, a lot of the people are older than me and a lot of the people can drive and I don't have my driver's license yet. So, um, sometimes I ask people for help, you know, <laughs> kind of nudge, like, you know, we've gone birding. Maybe you want to pick me up. <laughs> I'm on the way. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, you know, I'm good to find a rare bird or two. Yeah. Bring I'll, me along. It might be worth your while. 
yeah um but yeah it, it just feels a little weird i know some other young burgers but there just aren't that many i'm totally in touch with them all but yeah and when i went i actually went to a summer camp in camp Col camp colorado this summer with the american birding association and i got to meet a lot of young birders there that was really cool yeah i think that there's more of them coming up through the pipeline basically mm -hmm. because we noticed that the covid years more younger people started going out and trying to find birds so it seemed like it was kind of transitioning to an everyone hobby as opposed yeah. to you know being older people in general but i remember one time derek and i went to a chimney swift and american kestrel event and the person that was leading the event after like pulled us aside and was like thank you for being young and being interested in birds I mean, yeah. just, well, I, mean, I get a lot of comments about my young eyes especially uh yes <laughs> a lot of people like to say that See, you're um, good to have a long though then because yeah. you gotta pitch that you gotta be like hey you need some young eyes and people are like oh he's right should start carrying around a resume be like i can hear stuff that you can't i can see yeah. things like i'm yeah. you gotta bring me downside yeah. no <laughs> driver's license and then like, Ooh. yeah yeah i'm pretty good at just like identifying and finding things for for people though i found a few rarities like i found a couple of california gulls in uh 2019 and those those were pretty big i don't know 2020 actually yeah so talking about gulls you went and saw the ross's gull one of the first days it was found didn't you I did, yes. I was like the first or second or third person on site. So, oh wow! If you scroll back through all the eBird lists. My name is like right after the original finder. Wow, nice. That's awesome. Yeah, what was like your experience with it when you were there? Because I actually went today, which mm -hmm. for anybody that doesn't know, because the Ross's gull was a huge thing because it's such a rarity to even get into the lower forty-eight states. But it was found originally. It was healthy semi originally, and then today when we were there, it was pronounced deceased at one point when oh, somebody took it to a rehabber, basically, because it was just sitting. What was your experience with it when you first saw it? Because it seemed pretty active. So my first experience was kind of like the original finder. It was like the first photo he posted, it was way out on the St. Croix River, way out with uh, ring build goals, just like in the water. So I first saw it really far away and I took, of course, like 50 pictures and then it flew like right in front of us. So I had to like, I had to like go through all those ones I took and I was like, I took all these better ones, but it flew like right under the railroad bridge there and kind of did some feeding, got to see it dive down a little bit, catch a couple minnows. Um, the flight was cool. I got some good shots of the tail, which is a good ID point against like Little and Kitty Wake and stuff. Yeah, that must have been a huge one for you guys because I know it was a huge one for us because mm -hmm. it kept coming across the river. So people would mm -hmm. kind of go from one side to the other to try to see it on both sides so that they could count it on both lists on eBird. Yeah, it was. Yep, I got it. I got great photos in both states. So uh, <laughs> happy about that. So can you talk a little bit more about just like what the birding scene is like in Minnesota? I feel like in Wisconsin, we have a pretty good community. We're like a rare bird to see you know, everybody kind of tries to figure out, like, is that somebody's house if they're accepting visitors? And it's all fairly organized. Um, Louisiana is a little more wild. Every man for themselves. I, a little bit. Like, there's just a lot of stuff happening in different places, and it's not all populated, you know, evenly or anything. So what's what's the Minnesota scene like? Um, It's a pretty good birding community. It's mostly through Facebook that the birds get seen and reported. I noticed that because in my first couple of years birding, I was just using eBird. And then when I got on Facebook, I learned about things like 10 times faster. And I really enjoyed that. Um, the groups are pretty inclusive. And then I feel like the Twin Cities is definitely where most of the rarities show up, at least within like a short distance. Like the Limpkin was right in the Twin Cities here. The, we had a painted red start last year that was That's cool. right in downtown St. Paul, basically. I was and jealous of that one. Yeah, it wasn't doing so good either. I, I have no doubt that that bird probably didn't make it. Mm. It was seen in the morning and then nobody else saw it. And it was it was basically trying to get any food for its life on the edges of the houses. Mm -hmm. Was that like basically during winter time? If I remember. It correctly. was in late October. We actually had a early snowstorm. So mm. it was oh. it was snowing at the time. I always like to believe that they somehow found a way to make it south, even though I know they probably didn't. Yeah. <laughs> it's nicer to just think like, yeah, maybe it's out there someplace, yeah. still living his best life. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the downsides of the the rare birds thing is if they're that far out of the range, you know, 
normally, well, I don't know if I want to say normally, but sometimes there's something wrong with them or, you know, there's yeah. a reason why they're not supposed to be here. Yeah. I would say going back to the Ross's goal, I'm not really sure where this one came from. I, on the maps I've seen, they live in Greenland and Alaska and then like Siberia, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I also saw that they used to breed in Churchill, Manitoba, which isn't mm -hmm. as far by a lot. It's actually like, I think Hudson Bay is like closer than the Gulf of Mexico from Minnesota, mm -hmm. as far as I could tell by like as the crow flies. But um, they didn't, haven't bred in Churchill since 2008, what I saw in eBird anyway. So yeah, what's could crazy be, about them too is that I don't think they have very much info on the population no. because it's so dependent on the pack ice and what's happening in the Arctic that people just don't go up there to catalog how many are left even. Yeah, there aren't enough birders up there. They they could have bred right in Manitoba in like the the Hudson Bay Arctic habitat, and we wouldn't have really known. It could be a bird from there. It could be a bird from Alaska. It's hard to say. So, did you get the ivory gull that was in Canal Park a number of years ago, or was that a little bit yeah. before you? That's a little touchy subject. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's geez. a little touchy subject for our friend yeah. Bill too, who I went to look for the goal, the Ross's goal today with, because he drove all the way up there and missed it. Oh. And I was like, if we miss this one too, Bill, I'm not going gulling with you ever again. Yep. Um, that one also died. Let's hear I heard. this story. I want to hear this story. Yeah, that one. So for me, it was just like it was one of those birds that showed up. Kind of, I started like birding that spring, and it showed up in January. And I, my dad actually pulled it up in the local news he actually heard about it and he was like hey check out this cool goal and I was like oh that's cool but I didn't really know it was like a thing to chase them with um you know kind of the winter season here a lot of people are going to be making trips to uh Saxon. um how often have you gone there because I feel like if I lived in Minnesota I'd be there all the time <laughs> daily <laughs> yeah well being as I'm a Twin Cities birder I don't get to go there as much as maybe like a Duluth birder would but I go there probably like two to four times a winter just like incidentally kind of for some reasons and then like I, I have to go there at least once a winter that's like a requirement but um usually two or three maybe even four times and then I've got all the bog birds now it took me until I got the boreal and now I've got all of them so generally I guess I don't have willow tarm again but that would be a rarity to come down mm -hmm. yeah that would have to be an eruptive year for them I think yeah I think they were talking about it a couple of years ago, how they're They were. Them. Yeah. The boreal owl is really special though, for sure. Cause I actually, I saw your guys' video back in 2018, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't get the boreal owls that year. And that was like a year that they were more common than other years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw a report that was like made a week prior and we just kind of glazed through that area where the bushes were. And we didn't see any boreal owls and I wasn't on telegram. So that's where a lot of people are sharing the sightings it seems like yeah i mean we just saw when we found that owl it was just you saw the entire road lined with cars and you just saw a gaggle of people with their lenses out so we were just like that's got to be something and then we saw they were all aimed at a bush and we were like well that's not going to be a great gray or northern hawk owl so we got lucky with that one for sure yeah. i guess something that's tough about boreal owls owls generally is that they don't roost in the same spot either so they'll just keep moving to different places and they can be really hard to pinpoint for that reason so how did you end up with yours was that the one that was kind of staking out the feeders on that one road yeah the one on at the admiral road feeders stuck around for like i think three three weeks maybe it was there from the last few days of january all the way until I believe the last day was seen was February 21st and I was there on February 16th. It was like one of the most reliable boreal owls in the history, I guess. In the history of ever, probably. In the history of ever. Every, every picture I saw was in that same tree, which is a very non-boreal owl thing to do. And it's just mm -hmm. staring at the feeder. <laughs> so. Yeah, we think it, were, it was looking for bulls that were coming in to look for the, well, they were coming in to get seeds and then the owl it's kind of a food chain in action, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. What are some of the other things that you really like to find there? Because, um, you know, I consulted with you about the top five birds to find there. Like, what are some of your other favorites that uh, you like to look for? Um, well, I really like everything up there. I don't think there's any birds. That's that a cop-out answer, Matthew. Cop-out yeah. answer. 
I, 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 there's no birds out there that I just despise. They're all good. But <laughs> like, ah, oh, those boreal chickadees. Yeah. So they, tired of them. Yeah. The fact that we don't get them in the Twin Cities makes any bird that we don't get down here pretty special up there. But I definitely think boreal chickadees definitely hold a place in my heart for mm-hmm. sure. And then the owls. Everyone loves the owls. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I do like the winter finches too, like crossbills, grosbeaks. For us, we can go up to like the Nicolay National Forest or um, the Schwamigan National Forest and kind of get some of that stuff. So we can find pine grosbeaks and we can find evening grosbeaks. And if you're really, really lucky, you can get a boreal chickadee or a blackback woodpecker. But going to the bog was like one of those areas on steroids where it was like you actually can find them if you just look in the right places which was Mm -hmm. crazy because the day we went there we were just like oh let's look for this oh there it is let's look for that oh there that is it was such an epic experience to be able to find all that stuff so easily i guess compared to what it's like down here Mm -hmm. it's such like a nice compact square of land it's it's like big but it's also not as far Mm -hmm. as like the amount of species in in that area it's really like a good amount and it's like such a compact like square of land it, it's such a nice area to go to yeah and what's nice too is they so have well expected birded. places for them so like yeah. you know kind of where to go where stuff's been seen um i wanted to ask you about the three-toed woodpeckers too because when we went there we were lucky enough that there was one but you said they're not a every year type of species right yeah i think in my times going to the bog there was one in 2020 in january i believe or february um and then that was that one was in the winterberry bog and then the one that you guys had the that was in the warren nelson bog that was the only other one i'd ever seen in minnesota they are actually in like far northern minnesota i think more often than we think because it always seems like somebody gets one at such a random area but it seems like they're up in up in like cook minnesota which is about Mm -hmm. an hour north of the bog almost in canada and then grand portage minnesota i know has them sometimes grand marais minnesota Mm -hmm. up on the north shore and then once you get more inland where where you can get the the bog habitat again they they get more of them up there they're definitely not an every year bird in the bog yeah for sure which we didn't necessarily realize because it was just there So I was kind of like, oh, yeah, I got three-toed. That's probably here all the time. And then it was later explained to me, like, that was actually pretty rare that that was there. So yeah, yeah, when when we went, though, it was not a good boreal chickadee year. So we actually had to go up near Isabella, Minnesota to find ours. And we were, like, on the edge of Canada, it felt like, where, you know, it's the last frontier of northern Minnesota, basically. Mm -hmm. One of the main things I remember from that boreal chickadee trip was Barry had this thing of beef sticks that he was heating up by putting it over the like where the heat was coming out for the car (laughs) and then he was distributing them in the bag he's like who wants a beef stick (laughs) I do remember that yeah I remember we saw that snowshoe hair on the way up yeah that was really cool those are awesome yeah I've seen a few of those in the bog mostly in the last trip I kind of made a special effort to look for them a little bit more but they're they're at Warren Nelson actually just like right off the Mm -hmm. first platform too. that's interesting that's they were really cool yeah. i didn't expect to see those yeah it's cool to see such a white rabbit most <laughs> of the rabbits we have down here are just cottontails they're yeah. typical brown fur i guess maybe someday you'll think you'll see one of those uh white snowshoe hairs and it'll actually be a willow tarm again and then like, i'm <laughs> glad i gave that one a once over mm-hmm. yeah that's t- that's like one of the things you probably mistake it for honestly just like something white with eyes dark yeah. eyes Reminds me of like the snowy owl search because Ryan always says they just look like little snowmen. They also mm-hmm. look like plastic bags. They do. What's the snowy yeah. owl scene been like for you guys this year? Because we, it wasn't supposed to be a great year for us, but we have had a ton of them actually so far that have been found at least. What's it shaping up to be like um, up by you? Um, There's been a few in the Twin Cities and then I think there's been a few more out in like northern and western Minnesota um i don't think it's very maybe a little bit earlier than usual but some years we just get a lot and i feel like every year or two like there's just there's always a lot here because how far north we are but there there is one there was one in the twin cities and i think it left a few days ago but it was being seen by a lot of people so Mm -hmm. they're they're around most years but Mm -hmm. definitely some around this year 
Yeah, we're kind of lucky to live north enough that they're a regular visitor in winter. Mm -hmm. Because I think that if I lived in like Kentucky or Texas, I would be geeking out to come see a snowy owl. But living up here, it's it's always nice to see them, but it's kind of like, yeah, there's a snowy owl. That's cool. Well, remember remember when we started and we didn't even know they would be in the state and there yeah. were like reports for them. We were like, what? That's insane. Wasn't <laughs> it like a snowy owl eruption year when we started? It was, yeah. Here? So like we would just walk along marshes and be like, oh, there's another snowy owl. That's cool. So I had two questions actually, and they might require a little bit of thought from you. But I wanted to know, A, what are the best places to bird in Minnesota? So like somebody who's from a completely different country and wants to come bird in Minnesota, which places you suggest? And then after that, which birds do you think are the top ones to find in Minnesota? So like for us, we get the whooping cranes and the Kirtland's warblers, which are the ones that if you go to Minnesota, you're going to want to find in whichever time of year it is, not necessarily winter or summer. But let's start with the places. Like what places do you think are the best ones to go to? Um, so the, the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge is a big area of land that's pretty close to the airport. So anyone who flies in and doesn't really want to like go too far, they can, they have this whole place at their fingertips and it's got lots of, uh, places where a lot of people go birding. And I would say like one of the more, the uncommon sort of rarish birds that we have here that other states don't have are the amount of like trumpeter swans. Hmm. Even though they are technically introduced, they've been here for a while, so they're they're countable here. Um, but in most states, there just aren't as many trumpeter swans as there are here. So you can go to any like open water in January, February, even November, December, and just find tons of trumpeter swans. Even just anywhere in the Twin Cities, anywhere that has like open water, they're probably at, hmm. especially on the river valleys. I'm assuming um, that was a reintroduction effort, right? Because they were in it was. pretty they, dire they place declined, for a while. Yeah, they declined pretty yeah. heavily. They got reintroduced into Hennepin County Parks and they really spread. So that, that's definitely a bird people look for. As far as like other places to go, McGregor Marsh is popular for uh, sedge wrens and yellow rails, especially because mm. that's another like pretty sought after bird. But you have to be out there at night and that that may, that puts more work on you just because there aren't a whole lot of hotels nearby <laughs> but i feel like the bog is definitely the main draw for minnesota other than that it's pretty much just like rarities and then in the twin cities there's so many parks and lakes a lot of people have like their favorite birding patch and then they, they bird there like every day and you can sometimes people find like rare stuff just right in their backyard and then such a good sharing community to see all the stuff I feel like southeastern Minnesota is pretty good too, um, on the river valley because, you know, we're not in the ocean. We're we're up in the Midwest. You really got to stick to anywhere with, with good like water and migrant traps. On the Mississippi Flyway is pretty good anywhere on, along the river. What are the next birds that you really hope to see, either in Minnesota or, like elsewhere around the states? Like, what are the next ones on your list you want to check off? Um. I don't often think about like birds that I really want to see in other states. I feel like, like I just kind of see them when I'm in the area. I definitely really want to see a green jay in Texas. I really want to make it down there to like the southern part of Texas. Yeah, you, you'd love it. It's really cool down there. Mm -hmm. So different than here too. Such yeah, like a different yeah, very unique habitat. Yeah, um, I really want to see a black skimmer. I've never seen a mm -hmm. black skimmer. So South Carolina. Um, they're if you want to come down here i can get you one yeah i should take you up on that sometime <laughs> yeah that's gonna if, be um, like the farthest you've gone then to look for birds matthew that'll be a big event for you yeah <laughs> so when i was um earlier this year i was actually able to help out with some black skimmer banding and chick banding so that was a really cool experience to get to go out there and and, and band those too but i feel like it's a lot easier to help out with research in louisiana like if you just find out who's doing it you can email them and just be like hey can i help with your research and normally they're like sure i know that there's that hawk observatory is that in minnesota yeah there's a place called hawk ridge in yeah Duluth. that's what it is yep a lot of people go there for goshawks and golden eagles especially in like mid to late october um but there's hawks there just anytime in in mid-september there's 
thousands of broadwing hawks, more than most places get, because they hit the lake and then they always pass by that point by the way they fly. They don't want to fly over the lake, so they just follow the shore down. Um, yeah, that's a very popular spot, though. I, I go there every year, too, pretty much, just because it's right in Duluth and everyone seems to make their way there. Yeah, that sounds like quite the spectacle to see. Yeah, and then as far as going back to birds in Minnesota I really want to see, I definitely throw in the ivory gull again. I really want to see an ivory gull. I have such <laughs> a fascination with gulls. I really want to see that one. They're so unique. There aren't a whole lot of like fairly regular lifers I can get though. It's got to be kind of the rare stuff. I'm weeding out the common stuff on my list. So little gull again is another one. Little gull, ivory gull, and golden crown sparrow. I'm actually waiting for one to show up, kind of like a random bird. But hmm. I that's one of the more common AVA birds in general that I haven't seen. I was gonna say I think that they kind of come into Minnesota like not necessarily regularly but more regularly than they do in other places we had one two years ago i think that showed up in wisconsin near horicon marsh have you ever been to horicon marsh yet i haven't been to horicon i've heard of it oh matthew you've got to come to horicon yeah i've been to Cedar twice so i do have some wisconsin wetland experience but Mm -hmm. horicon is definitely something else i'd love to see it yeah horicon is like our sex and bog kind of Mm -hmm. So that's the place that I would recommend most people go when they come down here. Um, so you got to come check it out for sure. And then you immediately have to go to Louisiana to find black skimmers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can just head over there. and then just go straight down. Yep. straight. Yeah. Down. <laughs> well, you can hit Chicago. So you can go Horicon Marsh, then Chicago, and then O'Hare <laughs> to Louisiana. Yeah. I really want a black skimmer to show up here at some point, though. You don't want to wish a hurricane. So I know it'll affect Derek but it, it, yeah, it, it already it has <laughs> yes i know <laughs> but bird wise it helps us a little bit mm-hmm. yeah i get a frigate bird every now and again mm-hmm. when we had the hurricane like everyone in thibodeau like where i'm like a bunch of people evacuated but like baton rouge where lsu is didn't really get hit all that bad it's like all the lsu birders went out and they were seeing sooty turns and like frigate birds and all this stuff and i'm like dang it (laughs) because you're just like well i was worried my house was gonna get ruined and that guy just saw a sooty turn you know yeah right do you have any other questions um i don't think so did you have any other questions not off the top of my head um matthew was there anything else you wanted to mention about you know being a birder in minnesota or just birding in general or being a young birder um i really like the hobby i don't plan on quitting i'll say that much it's it's kind of addictive (laughs) it's very fun and once you get more committed to it and see more birds, you kind of dig yourself deeper in a hole of trying to get every single one. Um, so I hope in, in the future, I will be able to see a lot more birds and grow my lists and stuff and hopefully do more traveling. But I, I don't think I really have anything else off the top of my head. Well, cool. Um, thanks yeah. so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk and you know, tell us about the Minnesota community. Yeah, no problem. I enjoyed it. Hopefully we can uh, go birding together sometime. It'd be good. Yeah, definitely. I don't think I've ever met you guys in person, but you seem like cool dudes. You've got cool videos. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That's I'm what we strive to be. Call. If yeah. I go to Minnesota to bird anytime soon, I'm going to be like, you get out here right now. I'll drive you around and you'll help me. Find a bird. <laughs> yeah. I, I should be willing. I should be able. So <laughs> you're out here again. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Um, thanks so much, Matthew. And we'll see you around.